If you feel that you're unable to work because of an illness or a disability and you want to claim benefits to support yourself, at some point you're going to have to undergo a Work Capability Assessment, or WCA. The WCA is supposed to be a fair and objective way of assessing who's genuinely too ill to work and who's merely trying to get free money out of the system. If you fail your WCA, you'll be expected to look for a job or risk having your benefits cut. However, the WCA process has been criticised by many benefits claimants who say it's a traumatic experience and often wrongly declares people fit to work. Even more disturbing, a recent report from Liverpool University suggested that work capability assessments may be contributing to a national rise in mental health issues and even suicides, possibly as many as 600. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Ben Barr, the author of the report. But first, I'm joined by Dick Ackworth, whose son was wrongly found to be fit to work by a WCA. Good afternoon, Dick. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Now, your son Edward has suffered uh, from a very very early age from bipolar disorder. Does that affect very severely his ability to work? Yes, it's only one of the mental conditions that affects us all for work, or those sort of people for work. And I do a lot of work with Rethink Mental Illness now, and one of the things they asked me to do um, as a result of things I've been involved in was to write a, a, a reference to Ian Duncan Smith, and the title of it was I Agree With Dick. And I say in that, and I got over 15,000 signatures towards it. Your fit for work scheme is ruining lives. Many people with mental health problems are found fit for work when they're very unwell. Please stop reassessments for people with mental health problems until the test is fixed. And the trouble is the text hasn't been fixed despite the fact that uh, Mr. Ha Professor Harrington in his review in 2011 said there must be, they must build in more empathy and there must be more transparency. So tell and me about, about the effect on your son Edward when he was told that he had to go under undergo a WCA. Did it happen in the form of, 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 of forms that he had to fill in? Was that how it happened? Well, it, it's like others that I've helped with as well. There's a form to fill in, and if you don't fill it in uh, in the terms which the DWP accept, then you have to go for work capability assessment. And then you're passed on to have a medical test by what was Atos and is now Maximus. And they're doing these tests and they're costing um, as much to do the tests as they're saving in ESA benefits and so on. But in Edward's but, case, when he was asked to fill in the WCA form, yep. was he concerned or upset about it? Was he able to fill in the form? How did that go? Well, um, the, the truth of the matter is that I'm his carer and I do things for him to some extent. Yes. And in the end, we appealed and we got the appeal through and I went to a, a, the appeal in Bristol and the judge and the doctor who was sitting there as well were very fair and very reasonable and the judge just simply said uh, without any further leave he said I'm sorry to keep you waiting but we've been interested in the um, the papers that you presented and I want to say it's a win-win-win for you and I'm not making a political statement but there are 600,000 applications appeals outstanding that's the state of play and then shortly Dick, after Dick, that, what, what I'm trying to gather from yeah. you though is when you got the forms to fill in what yeah. sorts of questions was Edward asked because otherwise we don't have any idea really well, what we we're talking about yes. what kinds of things did they ask him and why were they too difficult for him to fill in why why did you have to step in to fill them in give me some examples of the questions well, on the form uh, on the form uh, questions 1 to 12 are totally irrelevant because they're about whether you can pick up a spoon from the floor and that sort of thing right so they're all about physical disabilities mm -hmm. and when it comes to the other disabilities the difficulty is that, that they couch things in such terms as to say does this happen to you every day sometimes occasionally or whatever and of course with the mental illness there are ups and downs and some days you're fine and some days you aren't mm -hmm. and one of the questions has to say about uh, you know when when you get into a mood what happens and um, you never know from day to day how it's going to be because something simple can happen on the news or something like that and that just sets somebody with a mental illness off mm -hmm. because they get anxious on behalf of other people and indeed on that occasion you know we just have to sit and listen there's no way in which one would try and challenge or um, stop a conversation going on that way because you have to let let his steam off once he's let his steam off he will come back to us the following day with a note saying dear mum and dad thank you for being there to help me um, I love you very much I'm sorry the way I was and Dick and, and Dick just just to just to check just so people get a vivid picture of this yes. Edward suffers from bipolar disorder there is no job that you can think of no job of any sort that he could possibly do 
is he being treated with 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 drugs for his for his illness is that there's nothing that he is capable of doing at all that you can think of no there, there are plenty of things he's capable of doing one of the things he's capable of doing is doing his music which is is uh, in a secluded room on his own where he does a lot of recording and so on and he's on his own he can go to his own place at it the other thing is we've just given got him onto what's called permitted work which allows him because he's in the support group uh, he's allowed to do up to 16 hours of work a week and for a maximum of 107 pounds 50 um, to earn without affecting his benefits and he um, is able to do a couple of our uh, sorry two sessions mm. in the village shop does them very well indeed but if he was required to do more it would simply blow up and, and, and go overboard and that's what's happened repeatedly for him and so we support him where he is doing what he's doing and and that's the way it is. Dick thank you very much indeed thank you for explaining that to us let me go now to Ben Barr a public health lecturer at Liverpool University the author of the report that we're talking about this afternoon Ben good afternoon good afternoon now you've compiled a report about this what is it about the work capability assessment that people find so very traumatic well we know that uh, from 2010 there's been this sort of rapid increase in mental health problems uh, including problems in including suicides so we looked at, at whether the program that the government implemented from 2010 uh, to reassess the eligibility of, of over a million people who are on incapacity benefits using the work capability assessment whether that led to an increase in, in mental health problems and we know from from talking to people and, and as, as, as Dick Atworth has said this process has been highly controversial and uh, there have been you know, some, many charities have been reporting and then doctors organizations of how it's having a, a detrimental effect on the health of their their patients from from the beginning of the process when people are anticipating being called up for assessment to the assessment process itself which people found found largely as being a very humiliating process to the threat of benefits being withdrawn and then you know, m many people have appealed and had had uh, um, you know, the decision uh, overturned on appeal. So then you've got a long uh, tribunal process that people have, have had to go through. And, you know, we need to remember that the, this is a, a group of people who are particularly vulnerable uh, because of their mental health problems. Um, how, how easy for, for that reason, partly because they're vulnerable people anyway, how easy is it to make a direct link or connection between the rise in mental health issues, the rise in suicides and the WCA? Is that something you can conclude clearly? So, so, so what we looked at is, is whether, particularly putting this, this one, over one million people uh, who had been on incapacity benefits for, for many years before they went through the uh, work capability assessment, whether that uh, was associated with this rise in mental health problems that we see across the country. Obviously, different parts of the country were affected by this reassessment process to a different extent. And we looked at whether those areas where more people have been through the, the work capability assessment as part of the this reassessment, uh, whether those areas experienced a, sh a sharper increase in suicides, uh, antidepressants prescribing and, and other mental health problems. And we found that it was very closely associated. And then when we looked at whether this pattern of increases across the country could be explained by other factors like changes in wages or uh, changes in unemployment or uh, changes in, in the provision of other services that you know, some services were being cut at the same time, these other factors didn't explain that increase. Let, me, let, me, let me bring in Ben, if you affected. will. Let me bring in Ross Clark. Ross is a columnist for The Spectator. Ross, good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining us. Do you accept there is a link between those undertaking work capability assessments and a rise in mental health issues and also suicides? Um, not from this research, no. I mean, I accept there are problems with the work capacity assessments and being cases where people have been passed fit for work when they're terminally ill and died soon afterwards and so on. Um, but to, to claim that they're sort of driving us to mass suicide is a bit outrageous, really. I mean, what Ben has done is match suicide rates in local authority areas with the number of people um, undergoing work capacity assessments in those areas and found a very weak correlation. And I know he's tried to correct the data, tried to adjust it, control it for um, things like unemployment rate, but there are so many, many different factors which will go into um, causing differences in suicide rate in, from one area to another, such as the age profile of the uh, district, the difference in occupations, I mean, rural areas, more farmers, they have a high rate of suicide, number of rough sleep 
sleepers the and, and all those kind of factors and, and you can't sort of really just from a weak correlation sort of say there's some causal relationship between work capacity assessments and suicide rates. Ben, ben, let, let's, let's give Ben a chance yeah. to respond to that. Ben, what would you say to, to Ross? Yeah, well, what we can see in terms of the pattern of those increases across the country, it's, it's, we need to be clear here, we're talking about the change in, in these measures of mental health within these areas. So we're not talking about you know, the differences in the level of those problems within, within different areas. So it wouldn't be explained by things like you know, the amount of farmers in an area. And, and we, so we can see that the change in those areas is very closely correlated with, with the, the reassessment process. And it is very specific. I mean, he talk, your, your caller talked about, about the age profile and it was, it was actually very specific to the age groups that were affected by uh, the, the reassessment process. And we didn't find the same patterns in older age groups, for example, who wouldn't be affected by, by this process. So it's, the, the associations are, are, very, are very clear. And it does lead you to think that the most likely explanation of this pattern of increases between 2010 and 2013 is the reassessment process and you know at, at a minimum it should prompt the DWP to investigate this further. I mean, Ross, we have information here. In, in 2015, a coroner ruled that Michael O'Sullivan from London killed himself after being found fit to work by a WCA. Uh, that alone, you might think, would give sufficient reason to reconsider the WCA. Well, I learnt long ago not to uh, attribute to the particular suicides, particular causes, because obviously with people with suicidal depression, they, you know, they, they lose the ability to think rationally and, um, you know, all kinds of things can be triggers for people, sadly, to take their lives. So, I, you know, I don't think one sort of case, one anecdote like that is going to solve it, the, the, the issue, and neither is um, this um, correlation which Ben keeps saying. Mean, he keeps saying it's a strong relationship. It's not. It's a correlation of 0.25 between suicide rate and the number of a work capability assessments going on in a particular area. That's a very, very weak correlation. But what really sort of bothers me about the um, pro um, welfare lobby is that so many of them don't want to reform work capability assessments. They just want to get rid of them altogether and go back to the days when people would be dumped on incapacity benefits and left there for years and years. Nobody would ever ask them whether they were fit for work. Nobody would try and help them get work again. And I mean, D Dick Atwood was saying earlier, I mean, you know, about, about his son, and, you know, I sympathise wholly with, with, you know, his bipolar condition. But, I mean, Dick himself said, you know, there are lots of things which his son can do in spite of his bipolar. And, I mean, that is what this process is and should be about when it goes well. It's getting people off incapacity benefit where they're just dumped there and given benefit and left to, uh, left to the, you know, on the scrap heap, if you like, and getting them into Job Seekers Allowance, a process where they can be helped then to find employment which is suitable to them. Ben, does that strike you as fair? Uh, I think I think one of the things to clearly sort of notice on, on for this from this whole program is that it hasn't even succeeded in terms of the government's own objective of reducing the numbers of people on these benefits. The, 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 they initially estimated they were going to save one billion pounds from moving people off the benefits because of this program. They ended up not saving any money at all. And in fact, since 2013, the numbers of people on these benefits has actually increased sharply. It's the largest increase that we've seen for over 10 years when the numbers of people receiving these benefits were actually decreasing. So the, the policy failed to achieve the government's own objective of reducing the numbers of people on, on benefits and reducing welfare spending as well as potentially having these quite serious health effects. Thank you very much indeed to Dick Ack with Ben Barr and Ross Clark. Obviously taking your calls on this 0500 288 291. That's Shauna Scoffery and Perfect Love Affair. Carolyn Bristol says the whole culture of welfare reform generates fear and the assessments are demeaning and humiliating. The 600 suicides are probably just the tip of the iceberg. I've done a work capability assessment and I'm not surprised that people can't handle it. And Dean in Barnsley says if you can push a button, you're capable of working. It's up to the government to find that person a relevant job they can actually do. And on the line, a gentleman that we're calling Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hello. And you have a, a, a stepson who's exceedingly mentally ill, don't you? Suffering very badly. 
Yes, well, yes, I do. And also he has Asperger's syndrome as well. Mm -hmm. And um, this really makes it bad. Um, and to say, Vanessa, we've had a bad time over these assessments would be unbelievable. And I say we because often it's myself and his mother that are very much involved in trying to help him through this process. But from the moment the letter arrives, which you always dread, um, it, it's just a nightmare because he's paranoid. He thinks that obviously, uh, you know, something's going to be wrong. They're going to try and make him do something he doesn't want to do. So his stress increases, his psychosis increases. And um, really, the assessment itself is so short and so meaningless mm -hmm. Um, that really, and I say meaningless, I'll explain that in a moment, but um, that really he can't, at the end of it, he can have no idea and he can't understand why exactly he's had to go through it yet again. And each time do they say that he is unfit to work? No, well, once they, they did, um, and I did explain to them that his symptoms aren't always the same and they're much worse sometimes than he's presenting today, mm -hmm. And um, that, for example, he swears at people and tells people to, uh, shall we say, go away yeah. unpolitely, yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, unfortunately, um, that doesn't seem to make any difference to them whatsoever because it's just what they see on that day. And would you say categorically there's no job he could possibly do, he could not work at all? <sighs> Well, um, you know, I think um, anything that he does is um, often so erroneous. He's tried, for example, he has tried uh, just as an experiment to work with computers and so on and so forth, mm. but it hasn't really worked um, at all because um, he gets angry and frustrated and then his psychosis increases and he just refuses to do it and so on and so forth. So, so, so you would say the WCA, it, it's a, a source of great misery and great worry for people who are already miserable and very worried. And I would say that we've been very lucky so far that he hasn't done something stupid himself, or not wow. something stupid, but, you know, actually, uh, you know, gone that extra step because he's talked about taking his own life before. And when these letters arrive, it happens uh, even more. And there needs to be, if they're going to assess people, fair enough, but let's do a proper in-depth assessment over... Uh, a, a decent amount of time and hear clearly what's going on. Thank you so much for talking to us, Andrew. We did ask to speak to a minister. Instead, we have this statement from the Department of Works and Pensions. They say this. This report is misleading, proven by the fact that the authors themselves admit that no link can be made between reassessments and changes to claimants' health. There is no evidence that people referred to in the report even underwent a work capability assessment. We've worked closely with medical experts and charities to make significant improvements to the assessment process, and anyone who disagrees with the outcome of their assessment has the right to appeal.